How many of you are uh, nervous travelers? Like not, not nervous flyers. I don't mean like once you're in the air, you're nervous about the plane. I mean nervous travelers. Like I don't, I don't worry about being on the plane. I could care less about that part. It's everything up to that that freaks me out. I get really worried about like whether or not I'm gonna make it to the airport on time, whether I'm gonna sleep through my alarm, or rather my, my alarms. This is an actual screenshot for a recent trip. Um, I am one of those people who sets like five or six alarms. Somebody pointed out there's a feature in the operating system that should make this not necessary, but I don't care, it's the peace of mind. I'll set like four or five alarms just in case I sleep through the first three. And you'll notice too, by the way, that they're all uh, odd numbers and not divisible by five. That is intentional. I freak, I, I don't know why. I just can't do anything divisible by five or an even number. It feels wrong. So it always is some odd increment. It's all I can say about that is everybody has weird quirks for trying to get through. This is one of mine. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm a nervous traveler. I, I worry about getting to the airport on time. I worry about forgetting my passport. I don't usually worry about potentially losing my voice partway through a conference, but maybe there, you know, I should start worrying about that in the future. Um, <clears throat> but once I'm on the plane, I'm fine. At that point, the worst I have to deal with is if somebody in front of me is going to decide to recline their seat into my lap for their entire duration of a flight. <laughs> there was one time, however, where I was briefly turned into a nervous flyer. Uh, I was flying out of Minneapolis airport and I was going to, I think, California, somewhere in California, and the flight kept getting delayed. And it didn't make any sense. Like usually like, you know, when you're in the airport and flights are getting delayed, you can kind of anticipate why, like the crew's not there, or hey, the plane's not there. Or you look at the flight board and like everything else is delayed too. So clearly there's some weather issues. None of that was happening. It seemed like it was beautifully sunny. Everybody was where they should be. Everything seemed like it should be normal. And yet we kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. So the gate crew, like a good gate crew should do, got on the intercom to explain to us what exactly was happening. And what they said, was there was a problem with the engine and they were looking for a temporary fix to get us to California. Now, I just wanna, I feel like most of you caught that, but I wanna back that up a little bit. There was a problem with the, the, the engine, the engine, the thing that makes the plane actually move, keeps it, in, that thing was broken. And they were looking for a temporary, not a permanent fix, a temporary fix, a patch job to get us from one place to another. Now, I'm sure there were fantastic mechanics and engineers working on that very problem at that moment in time. I'm not one of them. So when I hear a temporary fix, I'm thinking, all right, well, what's a temp, temp, duct tape? Duct tape is a temporary fix. That is how I would fix something temporarily. I don't want duct tape anywhere near my plane's engine. There's such a thing as oversharing. I think we found it here. So, uh, you know, to make a long story short, Eventually we got on the plane. I don't remember seeing any duct tape fly by. I was kind of watching out the window the entire time. Uh, we got to our destination, all right, but boy, that was, that was one nerve wracking flight. I was not comfortable with it whatsoever. You know, it's just not something I know about whatsoever. Um, and I'm sure for many of you, this is your day-to-day -day reality. When you fly, you get nervous in the plane. And I, I'm here to tell you that you are the normal ones. You're okay. For the rest of you, have you ever stopped to consider what it takes to get something like this, a big giant metal tube, thousands of kilometers in the air, thousands of kilometers across the ocean at ridiculous speeds? It's not something I recommend focusing on for very long because you get extremely nervous. Sometimes you don't want to know how the sausage gets made. And this is one of those situations. But I'm really grateful that there are people who do pay attention to this. I'm really grateful that there are mechanics, there are engineers, there are professionals whose job is to consider all the possibilities of things that might fail, build in the fail safes, anticipate when things are going to go wrong so that I can have a safe journey and get to my destination safely. I'm grateful that there are other professionals who I can trust to do their job so that I can just get on the plane and fly. You know, when we use the web, there's a lot of complexity that gets abstracted away. For most of us, for most people, when they use the web, it feels something like this. You grab any device that has an internet connection, you type in a URL, and moments later, hopefully short moments later, the site appears in all of its glory. And that's, that's it. That is what using the web is to most people. But you and I, we're the professionals, we're the mechanics, we're the designers, the developers building this experience, crafting this experience. And we know there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes. It's not type in a URL and boom, a site appears. It's type in a URL and okay, hold on, which server across the world do I need to talk to? Cool, that one. Let me negotiate a connection. Let me figure out how we're going to talk securely. All right, got it. All right, can you send me some data? Yeah, keep it coming. Oh, hold on, you dropped something. Can you send that back? Finally getting all that data in. Once it's there on the device, then we have to go through everything that Anna talked about, where we're talking about the 
parsing the, uh, the HTML, parsing the CSS. Oh, you got JavaScript. Hold on, we got to stop everything. Look at the JavaScript, parse, compile, execute that. Then figure out where everything's going to get laid out, paint it out, render it, and boom, there's our website. That's how the web works, more or less. That's the actual complexity, and none of us have to think about that on a day-to-day -day basis unless we're building it, right? We're the professionals, so we know there's more to it, than, but most people do not. There's so much complexity. There's so much variability. The web has to be the, if you like control, the web is the worst possible environment for you at all. Like, you control none of this. You control the source code that you write, and from then on, it's game over. Like, you have no idea what's going to happen. Like, our servers, how many of you have a server that's sitting inside your back room somewhere that you control firsthand? Right? It's you know, a couple people, like two people out of this entire audience. Most of us are increasingly using third-party services. We're using CDNs. Uh, we don't know exactly. We trust them to hopefully do their job right. They're professionals as well. But we know that things could fail. Things could go wrong at that level. We don't control the network. We have no idea what that's going to be like. It could be a, a, a data-throttled situation. We could have slow speeds. It could be regulated by the government. We could have people manipulating content like Harry demonstrated with a friendly mobile operator stripping out jQuery. We have no idea what happens on the network. We don't control the device. There are literally thousands of different devices with different constraints all being used to access the Internet. And we certainly don't control the browser. It could be the latest and greatest version of Chrome that just shipped probably five minutes ago. Or it could be some old legacy browser. It could be a desktop browser that's laden with every bookmark and extension and toolbar known to mankind. We just have no control over anything other than the code that we produce at the very beginning. You know, when you stop to think about that, I wonder why we get surprised when things go bad. We should be surprised that anything ever works on the web. There is so much stuff that could go wrong. I think it is our job to anticipate failure because the harsh reality is that things will break. Things will go wrong. And one of the jobs of designers and developers is to anticipate that and to build and design in a way that our site is still usable when something happens that is less than ideal. And it's really easy for us to overlook. It's dangerously easy for us to overlook because we build for people like us. And that's not necessarily a slam on any of us. That's not because we're bad people, but it's because it's what we know. Like our day-to-day -day reality is we're working on these high-powered devices over these very nice networks. And so we don't have to think about a lot of this stuff. And so what ends up happening is we build, we test, and everything's looking great. And when we fire up our site, we're really happy with the outcome. Everything is looking fantastic. And then our users come along, and it's not quite the same experience. <clears throat> the good news is we're better equipped than ever to be able to deal with this. We have improved tools. We have improved standards. We have had years of knowledge being accumulated. We are better equipped than ever to be able to account for the un uh, unexpected. But the first thing to recognize, though, is that we very probably have a visibility issue. Uh, I think, you know, Tammy kind of alluded a little bit to the thing with average and medians and stuff yesterday, right? Um, the average site right now weighs about three megabytes. This is sort of a token thing. Any performance conference at one point has to put an average weight of the site thing. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, three megabytes is the average site. But what is that actually telling us, right? Because we've got the average, if you remember, what we're doing is we're taking an entire sample size, right? Let's say we have a thousand different sites. And we're taking them, we're adding them up, dividing by a thousand, and getting our average number. That number may not actually exist in the data set. It's more of a representation of the data than it is a precise data uh, like point. Um, and it can be very easily skewed. If we've got a thousand samples and a bunch of them are like 20 megabytes and larger, it's going to skew our number way in that direction. And if we have the same sample site and we have a thousand, like 500 of those sites are sitting at like less than a megabyte, less than 500K, we start to skew our average this way. And so what ends up happening is that we get this number that's really distorted that actually doesn't give us a very good representation of what's going on at all. So we've shifted away from this. If you look at HTTP Archive, we're no longer showing averages. We're now showing medians. And the median site is 1.5 megabytes. It looks much better. Uh, the median is a little bit better. It is an actual like, data point within the set, right? But it's still sort of victim to some of the same issues in terms of leaving out a lot of information that is very, very important. So for example, if we take a step back and we look at the 90th percentile on HTTP Archive, it's 5.7 megabytes. There's a really big gap between my 50% and my 90%. 1 1.5 to 5.7 megabytes, there's a huge tail, a long tail of performance. And if we're focusing solely on that medium, we're going to miss all of these people. 
This is a, a chart from Speed Curve from a client I was working with earlier in the year. I love the, uh, the, how clear the bounce rate and the start render time kind of co show, uh, correlate here. I added a little yellow line to show where the median is. Um, but what you're seeing is uh, the blue is sort of the buckets of start render time. The pink is showing bounce rate. And you can see that as my start render time gets pushed out for this client, the bounce rate goes up very clearly. Like there's a very clear connection here. Um, but you know where the median is. Look at how many people, how many buckets, how many experiences come after that median value. And if we're trying to improve bounce rate on this site, where should we be focusing? Probably on those people, because those are the people who are bouncing and leaving the site. If we're focusing solely on improving that median time, we're going to miss a lot of the stuff that's happening over here in this long tail of performance. Now, we have this sort of... Uh, mindset sometimes that the long tail is the weirdos, the anomalies, like the odd situations. That's not the case. Every time I've ever dug in, I find out that there's actually some very interesting use cases that are dominant user experiences for a given site or application. In this case, they are a site that um, gets the majority of their traffic through social sharing. Um, it's one of those things where you log in with Facebook, you share a lot of stuff on Facebook. So this long tail is the reality, the, the reason why is they get like 60 to 70% of their traffic comes in on a web view uh, on an embedded browser. So an embedded browser is running inside of another native application. Uh, so anything that is at all CPU related gets to be a little intense. It, it's battling with the, the parent application and everything else going on in the operating system. So anything like JavaScript layout, all that stuff was taking a lot longer. And it wasn't an edge case, it was the dominant source of traffic. And that's what comprised all of these long tail experiences for them. And we would have missed this if we hadn't looked at it. So the long tail, it, it's not where anomalies happen, it's where the real world happens. This is where real world usage hits. I like to think of it as a microscope. You know, every application, every website has weaknesses and deficiencies. Now I know they're not put there by you, they're put there by your colleagues, I get it, but like bear with me, they're all there. What the long tail does is it sort of highlights them. It focuses on all the weaknesses and discrepancies that we would have missed when we're looking at our high-powered devices on our high-powered networks, things that we overlook. And it exposes them. It points out that they're there. It makes them more obvious and more apparent. They were there all along. It's just a matter of whether or not we paid attention. Uh, in accessibility, when they talk about accessibility, they talk about something called situational disabilities. Uh, temporary disabilities, right? A situation where you're, you're not permanently having issues with your site, or, but maybe you just had uh, eye corrective surgery. So for a little while, your eyes are extremely, uh, it's going to be extremely painful to use anything with high contrast or to brightness. Uh, maybe you're not permanently, you don't have issues with sort of mobility, uh, but you happen to break your wrist or you're, you're going through some situation where the wrist is really sore at the moment. Now the mouse becomes a problem for you for a while. Um, they talk about this because it's important to note that it happens to all of us. All of us are going to be in a situation where we find ourselves less than we, like it's much difficult, more difficult to use the web than it was the day before. The same thing applies for performance. That long tail isn't just the same people every time. We all find ourselves in the long tail at one point or another. We're on a commute. Uh, we're, we're roaming somewhere. We're getting to the point where we're, we've exceeded our data cap for the month. Um, all of those sorts of situations can come into play and turn us into that long tail experience. <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of work with MDN this year uh, around performance. Uh, and MDN, if anybody's like looked from a performance perspective, is pretty darn good. Like they're already performing pretty well. Uh, it's lightweight. There's not a lot of JavaScript running. Things are pretty fast. Um, but they still recognize that there were some performance issues in certain parts, certain demographics, particularly around the world uh, in some other countries and stuff like that, where they really wanted to improve their performance. They recognized that there was more that they could be doing. So they decided to focus on it a little bit. But one of the interesting things that kind of came out of this pretty early on was we were trying to find uh, out like where did like where did performance like really hit home on like when was MDN users really suffering? One of the oddities was that uh, Kadir uh, on the MDN team fired up Google Analytics, which is all they had for RUM at the time, and he broke it down by screen resolution compared to load time. And he looked at the top two resolutions, 1366 pixels and 1920 pixels. And he, what he found was that people at that 1366 pixel resolution were significantly less likely to ever return to MDN than folks on the large screen. It's kind of a weird situation. When you looked at the performance, it started to make a little more sense, kind of. 
Turns out people that had a 1366 pixel resolution have a twice as slow experience as those on a 1920 pixel resolution. Twice as slow. So our first thought was, okay, well, you know, it is a responsive site. Maybe there's something weird happening. There's some breakpoint that kicks in, some image, some JavaScript, something. Nope, nothing changes. The last breakpoint is before both of these resolutions. Um, so it wasn't that. So we did more digging. And finally, after a while, what we discovered was that 1366, it turns out, is a very popular resolution for low-end laptop devices. Things that you would be spending a couple hundred bucks on, probably none of us would be buying. Um, but like a $200, $300 laptop, something like that with underpowered CPU, lower memory, those folks come in at that smaller resolution. So what we had here wasn't a thing related to layout. It was actually a thing related to the CPU. We were CPU bound. And I think it's interesting because we always, uh, I, 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 I'm willing to bet that if we profiled 90% of the sites from folks in the audience, we'd find that, you know, the majority of them, the vast majority of them are CPU bound at some point or another. We have more powerful devices than ever, it's true, but we're also asking them to do a lot more than we've ever asked them to do before. Steve really brought that home with the JavaScript stats the other day. We're throwing a ton of JavaScript, we're throwing high resolution images, um, we're making them, our websites more immersive and richer experiences, which is great, but it does mean that we're taking all that power that we're building up in the machine and we're using all of it. So we're not actually gaining anything from that perspective. And when we think about CPU bound, we usually think about mobile, right? This is our usual, our first inclination, low CPU device, boom, mobile device, something like the Alcatel One X. Um, this is an Android Go phone that you can get for about 99 euro, um, 100 bucks in the US or so. And within its first uh, week in the United States, it sold out. Within the first few hours, it sold out on Amazon. It was massively popular. Um, and so I got one of these because, you know, I like to experience firsthand, you know, what it's like to use these sort of devices, and it's cheap enough. So I bought it, and I was like, I'm going to use this as my primary device for a week and, and just see what it's like. And I got to say, it was... It was terrible. It was, it, was, it was awful. It was like the worst thing ever. Uh, like sites just wouldn't load, things were breaking, the, the phone would randomly sort of uh, kick out of the browser uh, as I was like moving around. And it's not because the phone, the phone is actually pretty darn good. Um, you look at the specs, it's not bad. Um, but it's because we've built a web that doesn't work on a phone like that. Like we've built a web that doesn't account for phones that have a little bit less power, a little bit less memory, a little bit less CPU to use. Um, so I think it's important that we do this. Like it, this is, I, I feel like having a couple low-end testing devices around is one of the most powerful and important development tools that we have available to us, is to get your hands on some of these and experience what your site feels like. Pick up that cheap uh, phone and do some stress testing. You know, Anna, I think, uh, brought up repeatedly yesterday about how the difference between animations on a high-end device and on a low-end device and how, like, if you're not watching for that, you can build a situation where those low-end devices are going to have a very janky experience. Well, that applies to just about everything that happens on the site. If we're not testing inside of that situation on a lower-end device, we're never going to see those issues. Or as Ethan Marcotte put it, your website is only as strong as the weakest device that you've tested it on. But again, in this situation, it wasn't mobile, it was a laptop. So it sort of broke the mold a little bit. It, you know, we've got to be careful about how many assumptions we make. So I think it's just as important that we go out and buy a $100, $200 laptop. Go to Amazon and see what the top selling ones are uh, that are really just, and find the cheapest top selling one and buy it. And let's start there. I bought an HP Stream a couple years ago like that. Um, it's a really painful device to use, but it's really good for stress testing sites. But we also have improved tooling for analysis now. Things that, it would have been harder to profile what happens on the CPU years ago. Um, we're in a much better situation now to be able to do this. So web page test, which has been mentioned several times as it should be, it is a fantastic tool, um, has a lot of undocumented features because Pat, as amazing as he is, hates writing documentation, and I get it. Um, there's one of them is this throttle CPU uh, query that you can append. So if you go to webpagetest.org, throttle CPU, and then some number, um, what this will do is it will throttle any test by a factor of whatever you pass. So in this case, a factor of 3.x, which is a really weird factor to use in retrospect. I don't know why I have 3.x there versus like a nice round number, but remember the alarm clocks. That's, it's probably related. Um, and then you hit enter, and then you fire up a test, and this is going to throttle the device. Now, I don't recommend doing this if you're running a, device, like a test on a mobile device because you're already going to have you know, the actual mobile device being used, so you're going to have the same constraints. But if you're running something for Chrome, Firefox, anything desktop related, throwing that throttle tag on there 
um, will kind of give you a situation where it'll extend all of that out, make all of those little issues a lot easier to catch. We also have Chrome DevTools, which has the CPU throttling built right into it nowadays. Um, so you're going to have no throttling, so throttle it by a factor of four, throttle it by a factor of six. You choose which setting you want to use. Uh, and then you can hit record and either just start you know, playing around with the site and see what happens, um, or you're able to actually uh, refresh the page, reload the page. And what it's going to do is it's going to instrument and, and monitor everything that happens over the page load um, with this throttled CPU and record it so that you can analyze exactly what happened inside of the timeline. You know, this is stuff that we didn't have access to even a few years ago. So we did this for, um, for MDN. We fired up on speed curve uh, a couple tests that were running at uh, 3x throttle and a 6x throttle. We fired up on a bunch of web page test runs. We fired up Chrome. We were looking at all these different areas. And we quickly zeroed in at layout being a big issue. Um, a lot of MDN stuff has many DOM elements. You know, you've got this browser compatibility table at the bottom. You've got this list of contributors. The DOM size is pretty large. So anything related to layout or calculation of styles is pretty costly. And uh, specifically, right away at the beginning, we zeroed in on fonts. Uh, MDN, when we started doing this, is about 525K for the page weight. And about 370 kilobytes of that was fonts. Um, they were using six web fonts in addition to some icon fonts, which is in the process of being removed. Uh, they had op uh, Zilla Slab, Bold and Italic, Open Sans, Italic, and Semi Bold. Uh, and they were doing some good things already. They had our friend Font Display Fallback in place um, so that we had this experience where you weren't blocking the display of the font for up to three seconds. Um, so they had that already going for them. They were doing some good stuff, but there was definitely some room for improvement. Uh, Zach talked a little bit yesterday about the uh, Flash of Unstyled versus Flash of Invisible. Uh, Zach, I don't believe, showed this tool that he built that um, I love for a nice way of sort of visualizing the difference here, um, where you can compare the two side by side. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see a font load in with this, uh, where it's invisible first, versus this font where we flash the unstyled text and then everything lays in on top. And the difference is pretty striking. Now, some of you in the room may not like the whole unstyled thing. I get it. Like, there's the whole, like, design aesthetic part of having, you know, the, the style to show at first. Um, but I think three seconds of being able to read content as somebody who lives in an area with really crappy speed network speeds in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin, um, I've stared a lot of invisible text. So I really would much rather prefer having content to be able to scan and read. Um, but the other thing I like about the tool is that Zach zeroes in on those repaints and reflows, something he talked about yesterday. And that's what was hurting MDN. Um, we had this situation where you had these six font files, and if they arrive at different points in time throughout the page load process, which they were, we had several different reflows that were happening over the course of the page load. Zilla would come in, like they had one preloaded, that would come in early and be good, but then they'd have like a couple others, and then if like something went wrong on the network or something kind of hung a little bit and some arrived a little bit too late, there'd be another reflow. Like we had multiple times throughout the page load process where this was kicking in. So we decided to focus on this and see how much of this we could strip out. Uh, so we turned to font synthesis first. Like, could we uh, fall back to just like letting the browser fake it for us a little bit? Um, the browser, which is pretty good about that uh, for the most part, um, if it doesn't have a bold or italic version and it has a regular version, it's going to say, okay, cool, let me, let me see how close I can get. I'm going to try to fake the italic or fake the bold. Um, but each browser does it a little differently, and we wanted, and like each font is going to be different in terms of how good a, a job it does. Um, so we fired up a test page with four different iframes in it. Uh, we had one iframe that had all the variants of each font, and then we had another iframe that just served the regular version and then let font synth synthesis deal with bold and italic. And we fired this up in a bunch of different browsers to see what would happen. We were pretty happy with the results of the italic uh, synthesis. Um, so if you look here on my right, your left? Yeah, I think so. I'm good at this kind of stuff. Uh, if you look over on this side, the, you have the, the synthesized version. There's some difference between the italic variants, but it's not enough, we felt, to justify pulling in that another font file. We were OK with it um, from a synthesis perspective, just falling back to that. The bold, though, was kind of like, eh. Bold was not good, um, particularly on Chrome. Chrome, which is so aggressive on so many things, is very conservative on uh, font synthesis, it turns out, for bold. Like, the bold was practically nothing. Um, so we're like, all right, we felt comfortable at this point saying we could reduce potentially the italics, come in with just the regular variant and the bold variants. Um, 
But then we wanted to go a little bit further. We're down to four font files. The next thing was, could we, what if we used system fonts for something? Uh, Zilla Slab was not going to go anywhere. Zilla Slab is the one that's used in the logo, it's used in the headers, it's where Mozilla gets all of its personality. Open Sans is the body text, and we weren't quite so sure that was as essential for the character of MDN. Um, so we decided to play first and see if we could find something that was fairly similar. So for this, we turned to a tool by Monica called uh, Font Style Matcher. This is such a fun tool. Like, I kind of, I don't know, it's fun for me. I geek out on this kind of stuff. But it was, it, it, what it lets you do is it lets you load up a web font and a system font side by side and play with things like line heights and letter spacing and all of these other little variants to see how close you can get the two fonts to match up. And my favorite part is this visualization at the bottom where you can have the web font and the system font overlaid and you can see just how close they get. And so what we, disco we discovered by this was that if we played with Verdana and a little bit of the spacing characteristics, we could have a virtually indistinguishable uh, experience. Like you can see there's a little bit of difference, a little red and, and black shifting, but it's very, very close. In fact, when we put them side by side and we had a test run with a bunch of people looking at it, very few people could tell us which was which. I actually don't remember which is which. Somebody out there who's like a font type person probably knows right now, but we had a hard time noticing. None of the users could notice either. So we're like, all right, cool. We're going to just ditch open sans and use Verdana. Now, caveat, we started with this, and then we looked at uh, the, headline, or the, the areas where we were, we were using bold, and it turns out Verdana was okay, but Verdana bold is kind of a, eh. It was kind of ugly. So we ended up pulling Verdana. We're using Arial now, but the progression, like nobody has said a thing. Like every, it's been, there's been no negative repercussions. Nobody's noticed. Like that shift has been pretty seamless for us. So that brought us down to two fonts, Zilla Slab, Zilla Slab Bold, both of them coming in at 67K. So the next thing to do was to subset the heck out of these things. Um, Zilla Slab has all sorts of different language and characters that it's pulling in. Um, so we wanted to pull it down to just where we needed it, which in our case was mostly just Latin characters for this particular font. So we turned to uh, Pift subset, which if you've ever, has anybody used Pift subset? Is anybody, like the documentation is pretty meh. Right, like it's pretty bad. I think for the most part, PIF subset is like trial and error. Like I couldn't find any good like actual here's how you use it kind of a thing. But eventually, after tinkering, tinkering with it for a while, we realized that we could create a file, a text file that contained the list of all the Unicorn characters we wanted to include in our subset. Um, so we set up a file like this. Uh, you can see we're pulling in the Latin characters, and it's just defining the Unicode ranges. And then we can run a command uh, PIF subset pass in the font, give it the Unicode file, and what flavor, I like the flavor, I like that's a nice little flavor, of font we want it to produce, and it spits out a subsetted version. Um, we use this. I will say that uh, if you want a much more developer ergonomic way of doing this, uh, Filament Group's Glyph Hanger is, uh, is much easier to work with, much better documented. We just didn't know about it at the time. Uh, but Glyph Hanger is great. It'll do this and more. It'll actually let you pull out the specific glyphs that are used on a given URL or set of URLs. It's a fantastic tool. Um, so that would be a much easier way of doing it. We did it the hard way. But we ended up getting it down to about 33K each. So in the end, we went from 370K of fonts down to 66 kilobytes of fonts. We eliminated a lot of the reflows and repaints. Um, we ended up with about 300 kilobytes of less weight for everybody. For folks on a middle-end device, which we sort of defined by that sort of 3x throttle, uh, which we had set up in speed curve for monitoring, we got 12% layout cost. And for folks that were on like the low-end device with that 6x throttle kind of kicked in, uh, they got their time to interactive examples to display one second earlier. Now, if you've ever used MDN, they have the interactive examples where you get to play with the code. MDN's done a ton of research. That's the most important thing people want from documentation, apparently. So that is our primary performance metric. We have a custom metric around time to interactive example being ready. And it was one second faster for folks on the low end. Now, there's more work to do. Uh, we're doing some stuff with unused CSS that we've seen some really good improvements from. There's a whole bunch of other things coming. But already, we've made a meaningful impact on stability and performance for everybody across the board. Um, everybody got better performance. Uh, they got the better stability. And everybody got less data. And I know we've shifted from data a little bit recently. Like, data is no longer in vogue as like, something that we pay attention to as a user-centric metric. Um, and I think that's kind of a shame because to me, I, I worry about that. I feel like data is an extremely user-centric metric. Uh, for years, people have been relying on services like Opera Mini 
uh, and other proxy browsers or proxy services for the sole purpose, the sole reason that data is, they want less data. They want to be using less data on their plan. Data is cost prohibitive, whatever it happens to be. Data matters to users. Um, but services like this don't really work on HTTPS anymore because you can't, it's, it's a man in the middle thing. Um, so proxy services, even Chrome's data saver, which is great when it's in use, um, doesn't work over HTTPS. And I feel like this is one of the still remaining unsolved but very critical problems for us to figure out is how do we enable on an HTTPS everywhere web, which is great and should be there, but how do we still enable people to have access to these low data experiences when they need them? And I feel like, I, I think IETF has done a little bit of work for this for sure, um, but I feel like we have a long way to go towards solving this problem. But I think it's critical to solve because there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of cost associated with using data, both financially and otherwise. Um, sometimes it's just really mundane things, like you're on a low cost or you're on a high cost data plan, you're on a prepaid plan, and the cost of data itself is going to hit your wallet. Um, my favorite example to pick on here is Facebook Instant Articles, primarily because they kind of came out because they were like, the mobile web's too slow, and then they built a mobile site that's really heavy, and it's just kind of fun to nudge them a little bit. Uh, but if you fire up this site, what you'll find is that in certain parts of the globe, uh, it's going to cost you roughly, you know, a buck fifty in the U.S. to load, uh, and this exceeds the per day poverty limit, which means that literally in the United States there are millions of people who would not be able to afford this site if they wanted to, uh, to pull it up. Uh, and this happens in multiple different countries. If you look at it from a percentage of the gross national income per person, like how many, how uh, much people are pulling in on a day to day basis, some people are going to be spending eight, nine, ten percent of their daily income to load one single page. Data has a significant cost. And sometimes the stakes are much higher. When Hurricane Florence to tore through the US uh, recently, it left many people stranded in need of food and other essential supplies and information about like rescue efforts and, and, and what's going on. Um, you need to keep informed in a situation like that. Now, if you want information from an online source, which seems like a reasonable request, um, you have to be extremely careful because your power is out, so you've got to watch your battery life. Um, but you also know that you're going to be running through a ton of data. Um, there's, the, there's all sorts of limitations and considerations that come into effect. Now, at least one news publication recognized this, uh, and so NPR tweeted out during the hurricane, hey, we have a text-only version of our site. For anyone who needs to stay up to date with Flor Hurricane Florence News, keep battery and data usage to a minimum. Um, you may be familiar with this. This is actually the same version of NPR that you get if you, the GDPR notice comes up and you do not accept cookies. They just route you to this. And it is a text-only version. This is what it looks like. Uh, there's no CSS. There's no JavaScript. There's no images. Um, but what there is is the actual content of the news article in its entirety for you to consume. Um, I think this weighs like maybe it's just over like a kilobyte. Uh, so it's extremely small. Now, I'm not saying we all need to do this. Like... It would be disingenuous of me to say that this is a use case we all need to consider. It would be disingenuous of me to say that we should all have text-only versions, um, or even that they couldn't have used another kilobyte or two to like, format the page a little bit nicer and not have to like, have a little bit more branding um, and still have an extremely low data usage. So I'm not saying that we all necessarily need to do this, but honestly, I can't think of a downside if we did. Um, I think that would be A-OK. -okay. But I think there's something really refreshing about this idea of making the delivery of our core content sort of independent and decoupled from everything else and all the enhancements and everything else that gets layered on top of that. It minimizes the risk when something goes wrong, when something fails. People still have that essential content that they wanted to see. And again, most of the time it's more mundane situations. But even in mundane situations, it can have a very real physical effect. There was a survey done a while back about how people respond to... Uh, slow mobile sites. And uh, the results were kind of fun. Like 11% of people say that they yell at their phone if the site is too slow. Um, those are the calm ones. Those are the calm ones. 23% say that they swear at their phone. I, I kind of get that too. 4% say they have thrown their phone because the site was too slow to load. Now, I'm a little concerned about these people. This seems a little extreme. Now, that being said, maybe they're just training for the mobile phone throwing world championships, which is apparently a real thing that I discovered when I was trying to find an image to like show the phone being thrown. This exists. Everybody's got to have a hobby, I guess. Um, it also seems like it would be very therapeutic at times. Um, but no, like 4%, like they have a very, there's actual 
stress that is involved in doing this. And in fact, we don't have to rely on survey results. We can look at actual studies and see that there is stress that is occurring when sites are slow. Uh, in, in 2011, they hooked up a bunch of people to an EEG uh, to monitor brain wave activity and see how slow sites ex like impact stress levels and things like that. So what they did is they gave people either a two megabit per second connection or a five megabit per second per connection. Um, now, two things worth noting, that's not a very big gap. That's not like, you know, throwing somebody on something super slow and then somebody else on a high-speed cable connection. That's pretty close. So we're not talking like a huge difference in performance. And the other thing to note is that you didn't know that the net person next to you was on a faster connection. Like, they kept you isolated. They didn't tell you that, hey, you're going to get the slow experience. Um, so just people firing up on a 2 or a 5 megabit per connection. Um, and what they found is that the folks on the 2 megabit per net connection were significantly more stressed they had to focus a lot more. In fact, they had to focus up to 50, concentrate up to 50% more to accomplish the same routine day-to-day -day tasks that everybody else was doing, just because the web was a little slower. So performance does have an actual physical impact. And it doesn't have to be this way. I've worked with a lot of folks. I've profiled a lot of sites for fun and for not fun. And I can't think of a single example where the core task that the user wanted to achieve couldn't have been done in a lighter, faster way. Like, I can't think of a single example where that was the bottleneck. Instead, it's all the embellishments. It's everything else that we layer on top of that. The embellishments get in the way. You know, several years ago, the folks at Guardian talked about how they approached this, and I love this mindset. I just think it's, it's such a responsible way of building for the web. They talked about how they, they view the content of their site in these sort of layers of importance. It starts with the core content, which they define as their essential HTML and CSS, and a usable non-JavaScript experience. Then they have their enhancements. That's your JavaScript kicks in. You get some enhanced CSS. You get your fonts, your images, all your little widgets. And then you get the leftovers, the analytics, the advertising, third party, stuff that typically your users probably don't care about, but your businesses do. Um, but they viewed their site from these three different buckets. And they decided the idea being that we're going to prioritize from top to bottom. We're going to prioritize that core content and the enhancements and the leftovers. And we're going to keep them decoupled so that the core content still works if the enhancements fail. So that if the leftovers fail, the enhancements and core content is still available. And I think this layered approach is such a great way to build defensively for a web where we can't predict what's going to happen on the device and we can't predict what's going to happen on the network. BBC does a really good job about this. Uh, this is uh, BBC on, uh, with JavaScript and BBC without JavaScript. And you'll notice the only real difference here is that we miss an ad, which is a real bummer. Um, I'm, I'm upset about it. Uh, and then you miss the hamburger icon, I guess, too. But pretty much everything else is there. Like, you can use BBC without JavaScript to get a perfectly reasonable, branded uh, experience that doesn't feel off, it doesn't feel broken in any way, shape, or form. Now, yesterday, Harry said something about... Uh, not worrying about optimizing necessarily for folks who disable JavaScript. Um, and some po folks, you would say, you know, nobody does that. I kind of agree, honestly. I, like, the studies that we have say to like 1% to 2% of folks will turn off JavaScript, like, intentionally. It's just, it's not a super common use case. Um, that being said, I think more folks than you think run into that non-JavaScript experience. Uh, BuzzFeed, uh, Ian Feather from BuzzFeed got on stage and talked about how per month they get 13 million requests for JavaScript that time out every single month. Now, uh, this is BuzzFeed. This isn't some like down the street shop that can't afford to get a decent CDN and like a good team of developers. That's not what's happening here. They have all the resources available to them, but they still have issues happening. The CDN goes down for a minute. That's a few requests here. Um, as, as Harry said, mobile operators strip stuff out. Or as Jake Archibald likes to point out, like everybody is without JavaScript unless, until it actually gets down onto the page. There are many, many situations where you're going to find yourself wanting that JavaScript, like an experience where JavaScript doesn't need to be there. It doesn't need to be required. Um, Chrome interventions are, uh, are another one that has recently cost a little bit of heat. Uh, in August, it came out like in a news uh, article that Chrome for Android was going to start disabling JavaScript on 2G connections if you have data saver mode enabled. Um, it wasn't actually that new of news. Like, I think they had this in the code base since like January, but somebody just kind of discovered it. Um, but it's now on. It's, 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 I think, enabled by default on Android uh, if you have Data Saver enabled. Um, what this means is that they will not run any inline JavaScript, will not execute, any external requests will not be made. JavaScript just does not work. 
Um, Chroma's done a lot of great interventions, I think, in, in people in you know, slower connections and stuff like that. And they usually don't cause much hubbub, but people really get attached to their JavaScript. Does anybody remember the site, you might not need jQuery? Then it insinuated that maybe you might not need jQuery, and then people were really pissed off about it. And it seemed like that was a pretty tame thing to say, um, but people like it. Um, but the impact can be huge. You know, Steve said yesterday, the main culprit for slow websites is JavaScript. It's, it's what's happening on the device as well, it's what's happening on the network. There's a huge cost associated with it. Um, so I decided to see, like, what does this look like when this intervention is enabled? And I figured out, thanks to Yoav looking through source code and helping me identify what I needed to flag, I figured out how to test this. And I fired up uh, a bunch of sites on my uh, Android device with this intervention running. And the difference in weight was striking. Uh, for nearly everybody, they were seeing 80, 90% difference in weight. Let alone, now it, this is not looking at anything happening on the CPU, which is another huge advantage. This is just sheer the decrease in weight from having this JavaScript intervention applied. Now the two exceptions that you see here, that if you're like The Verge and The Atlantic, uh, turns out that they are doing like lazy loading of images, but they're also being responsible and they have images embedded in a NoScript tag. So if JavaScript doesn't run, um, these other images come in. But the reason why the page without JavaScript is so much heavier is because they weren't optimizing those images. So you'd like get the no JavaScript version, you'd get the image coming in, but it would be a massive like five, six megabyte image. So that's why the huge uh, increase in weight there. The, uh, the Verge, I believe, was the one who has already addressed this based on the article. I actually haven't gone back and looked, but I saw that one of them like saw it, fixed it, it's all good to go. Maybe the other one did by now as well. Um, but for most sites, this is going to be a huge improvement. Um, so you think about people coming on a, a data cap network or even on a low-end device, this intervention has a lot of potential to be very helpful. But I think it is fair to be concerned as a site owner because it doesn't work well for everybody. We saw BBC as an example of what works you know, when it, 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 things turn out nicely. But then there are sites like, uh, like AliExpress. Um, you kind of have navigation without JavaScript a little bit, but it's certainly not branded in any way. Um, this is not an in-progress screen. This is what Engadget looks like when you have no JavaScript running. Um, not exactly branded either, probably not what they're going for. So it is fair to be a little concerned about the intervention. But before you panic, keep in mind, it is an intervention and it is called an intervention for a reason. Nobody wants to do an intervention. It's something you do when you feel like you have to. You can almost imagine the conversation, like your website kind of walks in and the browser's just sitting there waiting and it's like, look, we're doing this because we love you, but, and it gets very serious, Tom. Like, nobody wants to apply this. They're not going to haphazardly throw it out. They know there's potential for breakage. They're going to be very conservative about when they roll it out. Um, so do you need a panic? Not necessarily. Should you be considering what happens when JavaScript is turned off? Absolutely. Um, and one of the best ways to protect yourself is to perform well already. I, I chatted with the folks that were working on this, and they said they are, one of the heuristics they're looking at is how light weight is the site to begin with. If your site already performs well, particularly when people want to save data, they're probably not going to apply this. So one of the best things we can do is take advantage of the Save Data header, which got mentioned yesterday. This gets passed along with Chrome Data Saver, or if you're using Yandex, or you know, any of these sort of data-saving services. And frankly, I think this is pretty incredible. Now, I don't get quite as excited about headers as Andrew does. Um, it's just not my thing, but I'm pretty excited about this one. And it's not because it does anything, it doesn't. It's because of what it kind of represents. Like, think about how many times we've run expensive surveys and research to try and figure out what does the user want? Like, how, what do they want from our site? This is the user telling us in big bold letters, I want less data. There, we don't have to guess, we don't have to ask them. It is there, it is clearly signaled. They're saying, I want to use your site, I don't want to leave it, I don't want to find something else, I want your site. I just don't want to have to pay so much data for the thing. Like this is a very clear signal from the user of what exactly we should be doing to this experience. Now I decided that I was like, cool, I'm gonna do some research, I'm gonna show some cool examples of what people are doing in production with the Save Data header. I tested the top 200 sites, nobody, is doing anything with the save data header. There is no meaningful difference in weight uh, when the save data header is applied um, for the top 200 URLs on the web. Which I think is a wasted opportunity. I think, uh, again, like they're signaling exactly what they want. Um, and it doesn't have to be difficult and it could be pretty creative and we could retain the branding of, the, of our site. 
Um, checking the save data header can be done uh, through JavaScript. You can check the headers. You can check uh, inside of the navigator uh, connection.api um, and get access to this, and then start making some programmatic decisions about what we want to do when folks want to use our site with less data running. So consider the BBC site, for example. Um, this is what it looks like on a desktop. If somebody comes to my site and says, I would like to use a little bit of reduced data, maybe I decide just to show the one hero image and just remove all these thumbnails. It's still very BBC branded. It's still a very beautiful experience. Nobody's going to feel like that's broken, but it saves them about 300, 400 kilobytes of weight just like that. Um, you could pull this into a service worker. Um, inside of the service worker, you can check that save data API um, and decide to make decisions like we're going to return a smaller image or a very highly compressed image, or we're going to you know, not pull in the web font service. Um, and you can start to make decisions there based on how that's working. Service workers are an incredibly powerful tool for handling like poor connectivity situations. Um, we often think of those as being in rural areas, but as Katie recently pointed out, it's not always the case. On a train ride between Washington, D.C. and New York City, which if anybody's not familiar with the area, is not rural America. This is big city America. And she was measuring latency, and she was seeing anywhere between 100 milliseconds to three seconds of latency um, because of all the inconsistency in these networks. You know, service workers let us defend against this. They, they, they pull a cache layer in between um, the typical stack so that we can prevent ever going out to the network. Um, the service worker will intercept every request. We can reroute it. We can cache things. We can have programmatic access, know what's there. It's ridiculous how powerful it is. We need to be careful with it. There are still th some things we can do wrong. There's a temptation when we're installing to download and, and, and add everything to the cache right away. But we got to be careful because that can still use their data. And if any of these fail, the service worker will not be installed. It needs all of these to be safely stored in the cache for this to work. And I also think we need to be responsible about when we store things. I love this pattern of instead of just blindly saving a page for the user, give them something like what Unikravitz is doing, where they have the option to save this for download, save it for later, and that will pull it into the service worker. Give the user the control over their own data usage. But it's an incredibly powerful tool. You know, we're better equipped than ever. We've never been better equipped to, to look beyond the median and start to provide these better experiences for users. You know, we can use these cheap Android devices. We can fire up these tools to experience what it's like when things go wrong. You know, we, if we're careful about taking a layered approach to our site, um, then we can prioritize that essential content, make sure that when things fail, the site's still usable. The site still provides a nice branded experience. We can do careful planning of font fallbacks. We can use service workers to provide a little bit of buffer and caching. You know, users and browsers both are trying hard to find ways to make our sites more performant. But we can be proactive about it ourselves. We don't have to rely on a third-party service that may break the experience. We can own that ourselves. The better we do, the less risk we see of somebody else jumping in and breaking things. You know, we don't control how people are going to use our sites. We don't control what happens once we send the source code out. But we are still judged by the experience that they receive. So we have a choice. We, the mechanics, the professionals, we can ignore the long tail, we can dismiss it, we can leave it to chance, we can leave those users to fend for themselves, or we can be proactive, and we can deliver an experience that's performant, that's resilient, that accounts and anticipates for failure so that even when the network is slow, even when the device is underpowered, when the inevitable happens, they still have a good experience on the web. The choice is ours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. That was great. I love the focus on the long tail where all the weirdos are. <laughs> you know, it's, I, uh, I have at least four or five moments in every talk where I just say something and then after it I'm like, oh, why did I? Yeah, yeah you're going to yeah, pay for that. Uh, dude, you ran over. We don't have time. I, 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 was, I know, I'm so I sorry. I stayed awake for your whole talk. No, I, I and wrote down all these questions. And now we, I appreciate we, it. I we'll, appreciate we'll do it. like one or two, but yeah, I know. I mean, you I know. kind of threw me off by pushing your chair in last night. I thought you were going to. That's my bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tim was supposed to talk to you about staying on time, so I'll give him a, mm. I'll hassle him for uh, that. Guy, you can't trust that, that guy. You. Yeah. you can't trust that guy. Uh, one thing, so maybe I'll just do one or two quickies. Uh, one thing, have you heard stories of these weirdos in the long tail actually being more valuable than uh, people closer to the median. It's kind of an anomaly, like 
you wouldn't, you, we normally see those correlations where as things get slower, people spend less money. But I've actually heard from some big e-commerce sites that sometimes people with these slower experiences are spending a, a lot of money and it's hard to figure out. Have you ever heard any data or any other kind of? I don't know that I've heard hard data that shows that from, from folks. What I have heard is uh, the, the story from the side of the, the person who's trying to access the site and they exist in that sort of long tail. Um, where because of the design or development decisions we made that kind of left them out, uh, they end up leaving. They go to a, either, either the competitor, which is a typical example, but there were also a couple of great articles recently where folks were talking about in situations where like this, they end up going to the store instead, the physical store, or like having to go to a physical store somewhere instead of being able to use the online experience. So I think like it's less common to see the hard data that shows like when we're losing these people, like, and like these people would be spending more and it's much more can, like and that's why because they're lose, they're leaving anyway they're leaving and they're becoming sort of invisible to us they start to fall outside of our metrics and our visibility and so i think most of it is just like the potential of the unknown like how many people are we losing because we haven't optimized this experience how many people are making decisions to go to a competitor to to ditch the online experience entirely and go to a physical store because of what we've done because we've left them out of it um, I have yet to hear of a situation where people weren't enable, able to you, improve the business metrics by focusing on that long tail. And I also think when it comes to e-commerce about the people who don't have the option to go to a store, you know, they are in these rural areas. And uh, if you're delivering that slow experience, then, you know, you never get their business. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's, Again, like I said earlier, it's not, nobody here is a bad person. Like, we're good people trying to do good stuff, but it's interesting to see how the decisions that we make or the decisions that we don't make end up leaving people out of the web. I shouldn't do this, but I'll ask one more question. How the heck did MDN choose to look at their data by <laughs> pixel resolution yeah. to yeah. find that? Uh, it started with the business metrics. They saw, uh, like, they, just looking at bounce rate, bounce rate by resolution kind of thing. I don't know why they broke it down that point, but they saw like at screen sizes, the bounce rate was a big deal. So, wow. and then we dove from there. I'm just curious, what was that a home, what, you were looking at RUM data? Yeah. Was it their homegrown RUM system it or was, is there uh, a vendor? It was, it was Google Analytics stuff at the time. And yeah. the Google Analytics reports screen resolution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we, we'll have to stop there, but at break, you'll be around. People I can come around. up and ask questions and yep. stuff like that. Very good. Thank you very much, Thank Tim. You. Let's hear it for Tim. Thank you.